Thanks, Brian. Um, trust me, having been in the space uh, working with customers for a long time, it is very easy to offend them and it's very easy for things to go wrong really quickly. So the subtext for today's talk was, from my point of view, was how to recognise how to um, respect and how to reward customers as you take them on the journey towards demand response. So I come from a company called City Smart, we're a sustainability agency. We help households and businesses reduce their impact on the environment. We do that across a number of products, including reducing energy usage, uh, reducing water usage, and minimising waste creation. So we do a whole lot of different programs. You know, our business is about the business of consumer engagement and behaviour change. That's a really, really hard business to be in. We all know, we've heard this morning about all the challenges, and there's lots of issues that you face when you're doing this, but, you know, in an attempt to continually uh, do this better, we've been on a journey for a long time because we think and we believe that if you start uh, with the customer in mind and understand what the customer expectation is, you can work backwards, backwards from there to understand how you need to shape your message and what channels you need to use to deliver those messages. So um, we've been on this journey and I just want to share some of the findings. Last year, uh, with some significant funding from the ECA and a lot of financial support from about seven networks across Australia, we started some research into understanding households so that we could begin down the journey of developing better value propositions that we could push out to customers, recognising that they're not all the same. Recognising that customers are not all the same, and so I'd like to share some of that with you if I could. You know, we started that um, that process with the theory that not all households were the same, um, and that energy is used in households as a group. It's not used as individuals, it's used as a group, and we really need to focus on what those households are doing. So we set out to understand households, and we found, um, we did some segmentation work, and what we actually found was that households have a style. There's some very distinct and large segments that we pulled out of Australian households. And they have st a style, and this style um, is resilient. It stays with the household for quite a period of time, and it only changes when there's environmental changes to the house. You know, they change location or members of the family move in and out. And this style has nothing to do with how they buy energy. It's how they face the world. It's how they interact with the world, because energy is just a small part of the world that they face. Um, and so the style is, is reflected and very similar in the way they go about buying internet, the way they decide what holiday to, you, to uh, take, what car to buy, um, and what energy supply to use and how they might respond to the way they use energy. So there's a couple of uh, things that dictate that style. And I might just add um, that we had some really good social marketing researchers from Queensland University of Technology who helped us with this program. Um, they're actually speaking in the room next door about a separate uh, customer engagement program that we did around gamification, and I'll touch on some of the stuff we learned from that as well a bit later. So I might start with this. So um, the style that, fa that households face, that we found, were dictated by four things. Firstly, and most importantly, um, we found that what the household is trying to achieve, the goal that it sets itself, is very, very important, and households will typically sit across a spectrum at one end, you'll have a household that are very consensus, consensual driven about what they're trying to achieve. They're either trying to be, you know, maybe really innovative or they're trying to live for a great lifestyle or they're trying to see, be seen as leaders. At the other end, you can have very um, dysfunctional uh, households in the way they set their goals. You know, you might have a lot of co coercion um, and bargaining going on to try and achieve what the household needs. And this was the biggest determinant of what created style within the household. The second thing was the organisational structure of the household, whether it was you know, very bureaucratic um, or autocratic, and everyone had a go at what was going on, um, and households sat across that range. Uh, the way they made decisions also helped determine the style of the household, and finally, the way they um, sourced information for their decisions determined the style of the household. And from all of this information and from a big uh, data set, we were able to identify six core segments. We gave these segment names animal names, and the reason we gave them animal names is our researchers had had similar success in some medical research that they've been doing, and, and by naming segments after animals, we're, we're able to create some intuitive understanding of how that segment might be, behave. 
Um, and we're pretty confident when we name them using animals, we're not going to offend people and we're not going to cause people to step out of a segment by saying that I don't belong to that segment. And, you know, we see some terrible, terrible examples of poor segment naming. Um, I've seen names like Debt Star for people who are heavily in debt. And, you know, that's just a terrible name to call a segment. Or uh, Quality Fanatics. You may love quality, but that doesn't make you a fanatic. So you want names that will enable people to step into a, a segment. So these are our segments, and they're really, really interesting, and I'll very quickly just run through what they are. So you have the flock of geese. The flock of geese are a household who typically have people who take turns leading that household on different decisions, depending on where their expertise lies. You have the ants. Now, the ants are very bureaucratic. They have one leader, and they're very focused on achieving something, and everyone understands the part that they play in achieving whatever it is they set out to achieve. The wallabies are as exactly what you'd expect. They're a bunch of people who just jump around and enjoy life. You know, everything is about lifestyle and nothing else really matters. Now, they actually achieve quite a bit, but the most important thing to them is what they're doing outside of work and outside of the things that they need to make their life happen. So, you know, they're an interesting segment. We have the bees that look like the ants, only different. You know, they're very bureaucratic, but they're a group of experts working together. When bees leave the hive, um, they're not told where to go, they're not told what flowers to go after and how much pollen to collect. So there are a whole lot of experts who work together to achieve uh, the aims of that household. Then we have the two cat groups. We've got the domestic cats who sit on the couch and just want to be served. Bring it to me, I'm not interested in doing anything at all. And then you've got the lions who are the king of the domain and they are the innovators. They're at the front end of chasing everything that's going to make them bigger and better. Sitting off to the side are two personas. So these are types of households that we found inside the segments. And I only put them there because they're really interesting. You've got the camels and the brumbies, both different in their own way. But what's important about these two uh, personas is they don't care what you've got to say. They're not interested and they're never, ever going to listen. And if you waste a single dollar trying to convince them to change or do whatever they want to do, then that's a dollar wasted and you'll never see it back. So, you know, if you can identify who these people are, you can stay away from them, you can get better return on the rest of your marketing dollar. Um, so it's just worth knowing that they're there. Now the thing is, once you start to understand these segments and understand what they're trying to achieve and understand what you think might be standing in the way of them achieving it, you can start to develop value propositions that appeal to them, that talk to what's important to them, that overcome their perceived barriers. And let me just say that again, their perceived barriers. A lot of these households perceive that there are things stopping them from achieving their goals. They're not necessarily actually barriers, but in their, in their estimation, they're problems. And so once you know them, you can work to break down those barriers and it helps you move along the path uh, of delivering your customer value proposition. So we've taken this research and we're now actually just about to work with some of our network partners again and go out and uh, test some of these value propositions. The idea being we want to go out to households and start talking to them about demand response in a language that's important to them, that resonates with them, that will get them to turn and face us so that we can start to push information to them in a way that they're willing to take that information. Um, so this, that's really interesting and this is really interesting and I guess the whole point of everything I've just shown you is we need to be really conscious when we're talking about households that they're not all the same and we need different messages for different groups and they need to be really need to be crafted in a way that is meaningful to those groups. And some of the other things that we found through this process um, is that there are actually different ways to provide information to customers, um, but we were testing to understand what their preferences were. Um, and, and this was a very small part of our trial, but it's just interesting to share. So we wanted to understand how they wanted information served up to them to help them understand it. And you can see from that diagram that um, most households are, are just overburdened with complex information and they're just looking for simple, easy, fun ways to gain information that, that they can gather along the way, whether that be through colourful apps or through uh, gamification or through uh, events that engage them in ways outside of the traditional ways. You know, uh, providing uh, track and monitor and report type activities to customers is not as popular. People see that as quite tedious and difficult to absorb. Um, and there's a lot of people who are not interested in having anyone come to their house face to face. Sorry, I shouldn't say there's a lot of people. In our group, there was a lot of people. And I should mention, because I didn't mention it earlier, 
we focused on digital natives here because we are a digital agency and we know uh, that that's not the whole market, it's only half the market, but we understand that you can't be all things to all people. So in our digital marketing, sorry, in our digital natives group, face-to-face -face marketing is not successful. But I should also add, we do a lot of face-to-face -face interventions with other groups that work successfully and work really well. So that was a really good inf uh, finding. We mentioned it a lot this morning, but trust matters. Um, we found um, that it's, it's really important that we build trust and we found a little bit out about rewards along the way as well. We found that there are several different types of rewards that we need to investigate if we're going to get people to take steps forward. The first being intrinsic. These are rewards that build self-efficacy. These are rewards uh, that people um, are able to prove to themselves that they can achieve things. And, and these are far more important than we ever thought um, possible. You know, we run gamified programs where people just pursue badges just to prove to themselves that they can achieve things. At the same time, the extrinsic rewards, the external rewards become really important as well. And just closing, I would say to you that if you're going to offer rewards, whatever they might be, it's important that those rewards are seen in the eyes of the customer as being attainable, worth the effort to achieve, uh, and likely to be delivered in some meaningful time frame. So there's a whole lot of issues that need still to be investigated about rewards because a poorly designed reward can actually work as a disincentive. So there's some of the learnings that we've had from our research. I'll pass it on to the others now, so thank you. Thank you.